You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for April 26, 2024. This week, a listener comment about colored boxes and guidelines, the mysteries of what to do with non-culprit coronary lesions during PCI for MI, and the mysteries of AF ablation, and the problem of surrogate markers. First, some listener feedback. I received feedback this week on comments I made during the March 29th podcast regarding guidelines. I opined, as I often do, on the complexity of medical practice and the folly of guideline writers trying to simplify things with colored boxes with grade one, two, or three recommendations. I've always thought it is silly to try and make algorithms for patient care because so few patients easily fit into those boxes. My take has always been to do the guideline documents, write the narrative reviews with the references, and then leave the boxes out. However, a physician friend of mine who has amazing training at a big center, but practices in a remote area of the world, wrote to me in disagreement. He made the case that algorithms and computers may be better than poorly informed doctors. He sent me many crazy examples of bad care that he has witnessed. These, he wrote, are errors due to poor training, lack of knowledge, and lack of curiousness. But then he shocked me because such poor care wasn't limited to rural areas. He noted that it could be seen in academics. Countries that I had previously thought had excellent care, he wrote, can be horribly influenced by poor knowledge and financial conflicts of interest. I paraphrased some of his writing. Quote, fraud studies with manipulated data. Doctors implanting ICD are doing ablations without indication, just to get financial support from the companies. Stents implanted in stable coronary disease. Healthy patients get Holter and Echo just to fill the pockets of cardiologists. I saw a lack of interest in knowledge wherever I look. Black and white thinking. Coronary disease equals beta blockers. If bradycardia, then pacemaker. And that's why my friend wrote to me that flowcharts and guidelines are very good. As normal doctors... Greater than 90%, in his opinion, don't read books and papers, and at best, they check the respective section in the guidelines. So my friend is convinced that data-filled computers could be better uh, than normal physicians. And this, which is also quite pessimistic, he wrote that basic medical knowledge is often not applied. I would even say common sense is not applied so often. Papers aren't read much and understood even less, neither by junior nor senior doctors. So, John, it cannot be expected that subtle scientific nuances are considered in clinical practice. In my opinion, human beings, including doctors, are worse than computers. It's very sad, yes. So, my friends, I don't know what to say about this email. I've presented, actually, to guideline writers, and they have expressed similar thoughts albeit in a lot less stark terms. Namely, the guideline writers have told me that most doctors don't have or take the time to understand the nuances of evidence, and they rely on these colored boxes. I guess that is the role of this podcast. I hope to provide listeners some nuance beyond the colored boxes of guidelines. And may I also hope that my colleague's experience is not representative of most of our profession. I will continue to hold an optimistic view of this wonderful job of doctoring. All right, topic today, the mystery of what to do in the cath lab after fixing the culprit lesion, the full revask trial. Interventional cardiology often confuses me. Antiplatelet regimens, for instance, after PCI, have oodles of studies, but I have yet to grasp the ideal recipe. 
choices of revascularization during an acute PCI is a close second. What I mean is that when patients have an acutely occluded coronary vessel, emergent PCI is one of the purest therapies in all of medicine. But, but, what if there are other stenoses there besides the culprit lesion? Should these be stented or treated only with medical therapy? I mean, stable coronary disease is stable, right? Well, in 2019, the complete trial randomized STEMI patients who had multivessel coronary disease to culprit-only PCI or complete revascularization. Follow-up was about three years, and there were a whopping 2,000 patients per treatment arm incomplete. And complete revascularization was the clear winner. Both co-primary composite MACE endpoints clearly favored complete revascularization. For instance, cardiovascular death or MI occurred in 7.8% versus 10.5% complete versus culprit only, respectively. That's a nearly 3% absolute risk reduction, and the hazard ratio was 0.74, or 26% reduction. And it didn't matter whether the non-culprit or extra lesions were done during the hospitalization or later. Nearly all the non-culprit lesions qualified on the basis of visual estimation of stenosis in other words, the clinician thought the lesion was greater than 70%. That, to me, sounds like a statistically robust and clinically important finding. In two words, fix everything. In addition, there was also the positive FIRE trial, which enrolled older patients with MI and found a 36% lower rate of the composite endpoint of CV death at MI with a physiology-based complete revascularization versus culprit only. I'll link to both of those studies. Well, well, the full revask trialist said that the visual estimation is not ideal, and that's hard to argue with. The luminograms are known to be problematic. They posited that hemodynamic assessment of the non-culprit lesions would better identify the lesions most worthy of PCI and, at the same time, minimize stent burden. They used fractional flow reserve, FFR, a wire-based way of evaluating the hemodynamics of the flow limitation. And they cited the FAME-1 and FAME-2 trials, which I have previously criticized as not obviously showing any clear benefit. But that's another story. We shall, for the sake of argument, assume that FFR, or hemodynamic assessment, does indeed help assess the importance of a stenosis. The objective of the full revask trial, therefore, was to assess whether FFR-guided complete revascularization results in better cardiovascular outcomes than an initially conservative approach of doing just a culprit-only PCI in patients having a primary PCI for a STEMI. The results were somewhat surprising. There was no significant difference in the composite MACE primary endpoint of death, MI, or unplanned revascularization with FFR-guided complete revascularization versus culprit only. Now, unlike the 4,000 patients in complete, a full revask had 1,500 patients total, but followed them for longer, for nearly five years. The primary outcome occurred in 19% versus 20.4% complete versus culprit only. That's a hazard ratio of 0.93, and the conference intervals were wide, they ranged from 0.74 to 1.17. There was also no significant difference in the secondary endpoints of CV death or MI. Here, the hazard ratio was 1.12. There were, however, more stent-related issues in the complete arm. Stent thrombosis occurred in 19 versus 7 patients, complete versus culprit. That's a hazard ratio of 2.8x. There's restenosis, uh, 32 versus 18. And there were no differences in safety outcome. One interesting nugget from the full revest trial is that FFR reduced the number of stents, like in the original FAME trial. Only half of non-culprit vessels in the complete revask arm who had an FFR measured had a significant FFR of less than 0.80. But despite the theoretical advantage of reducing stents with FFR, the complete arm obviously had more stents than the culprit-only arm, and hence more stent-related events, but still no overall benefit in outcomes versus culprit only. So, my comments. You, you see why I'm confused here. If an operator just does old-school visual assessment of the degree of stenosis and uses that to completely revascularize the heart, it's better than culprit only. 
clearly better. Complete and fire trials were much better with doing all the lesions. But if the operator uses FFR in an attempt to pinpoint the most important stenosis to stent, it's no better than culprit only. Uh, really? Well, the authors and Dr. David Cohen on Twitter both write that FFR in the setting of an acute MA may not deliver the same actionable results as it does during chronic CAD cases, and that's certainly plausible because MI changes lots of things. Fortunately, there is an ongoing trial called COMPLETE-2, and it's going to evaluate physiology-guided as compared with angiography-guided complete revascularization of non-culprit lesions among patients with acute MI and multivessel disease. But my friends, going into that trial, though, the results of full revasc surely leads to pessimistic prior beliefs, right? So you're going to have to see a very strong signal of physiology-guided complete revascularization to overcome these pessimistic priors. In the end, I'm beginning to wonder whether the question of what to do in the cath lab after you've stopped the heart attack is a lot like choosing the best AF treatment strategy. That is, clinician judgment may play a bigger role than evidence. Gulp. I can't believe I just said that. Okay, next topic, AF ablation mysteries. The Great Societies of VP, ERA, HRS, Asia Pacific, Latin America, have published a new expert consensus document on AF ablation. It's 107 pages with many hundreds of references. All the big names are on it. As with all of these documents, the review is excellent. If you read it, you will learn the state of the art of AF and AF ablation. But today, I'd like to take some time out and show you a modest small study from Bern, Switzerland, that exposes the lack of correlation between a 107-page expert document and actual knowledge. Before the study, let's make some brief points. First point, in general, in most patients with symptomatic drug and time refractory AF, ablation does seem to work to reduce AF. But success is modest. This is no WPW ablation. Patients with AF often ask me, how do you know where to ablate? And my answer is that I don't. No one does. Then I go on to explain that PV musculature does seem important. We have learned that electrically isolating these areas leads to a reduction in AF episodes in some or most cases. But come on, friends. Don't you think that at least some of the reason we ablate the pulmonary veins is that we can? We can put a catheter in there. We can ablate around it, and voila, the PV signals are gone. And it's neat. Everyone cheers when the vein signals go away. But it's sort of soft thinking, though, because... A neutral Martian might ask, hey, professor, what, what about the vast majority of the rest of the atrium there, including the right atrium? Then Jack E.P. has published a study from the Bern University Group in Switzerland. First author is Oscar Galuska. It's a small study, but it's interesting. This group did AF ablation using something called a CLOSE protocol. Now, basically, the CLOSE protocol is a way to get point-to-point -point RF applications close together and have good lesion characteristics using contact force at the point of the burn. It's really just another way to get good quality PV isolation. They then took 26 patients who had that back to the EP lab at six months, regardless of whether they had AFib. Now, these are always important studies because in practice, we would never take a patient back to the lab if they were free of AFib because a transeptal puncture has risk. Small risk, but risk. But from a research point of view, you learn a lot doing redo procedures. And there's been about seven of these studies mandated uh, redo LA mapping after ablation, which the Byrne authors have listed in the table in their paper. The Byrne group found that 58% of patients had all four PVs isolated and 42% did not. 42% did not. That's sobering because these are experienced operators doing a study in which they know a patient will come back. So they're trying hard to get PV isolation. Now, considering PVs, they found that one in four pulmonary veins had reconnected. Second main finding of this small paper, six of the 26 patients, or 23%, had recurrent AFib, but get this. 
Recurrence of AFib occurred in 33% of the patients who had perfect, complete isolation of all the veins, and in 9% of patients with PV reconnections. PV reconnection looked protective. After redo PVI in patients with re PV connections and additional ablation in patients with recurrences, but durable PVI, 17 of 26 patients, 65% were free of arrhythmia after 12 months. 65% were free of arrhythmias. Now my comments, before I opine on this paper, let's set out that these are small numbers, six recurrences and only 26 patients, but still I find it humbling. First, think about it. In 2024, using a careful RF ablation protocol in experienced hands in Switzerland, more than 40% of patients had reconnected PVs at six months. Then, AF recurrence is in 33% of the patients with total PV isolation, which is the goal, and only 9% in those with reconnection PVs, which is something we try to avoid. Then, even after re-isolation in the second procedure, 35% of patients still have AFib. So, we've been ablating AFib for 24 years, and this is where we were at? It's darn humbling. The burn experience, I think, is representative, too. I often see patients with recurrent AF after a PVI and at repeat ablation, the veins are totally isolated. Perfect. AFib, therefore, is obviously coming from a different geography. Here in the Burr study and in other studies of mandated repeat procedures, we see people with reconnected veins and have no AFib. So they had a less than ideal first procedure and they still don't have AFib. That too means that ablation must have hit something other than the PV uh, source or uh, gulp, AFib simply went away because lots of early AFib goes away. See Soren Diedrichsen's paper in Czech in 2019 titled The Natural History of Subclinical AF Detected by Loop Recorders, which I'll link to. I also want to mention another study similar, a group in Liverpool, UK, also published a similar mandated study last week. This is in Heart Rhythm. They studied 44 patients with significant left atrial disease diagnosed by electrograms, uh, and they were randomized to either RF or cryoballoon ablation. The protocol mandated repeat redo procedures at two months regardless of symptoms, and 38 of the 44 patients actually had a repeat procedure. And again, similar findings, PV reconnection was observed in 48% of all PVs. They found reconnection of at least one vein in more than 75% of patients. This, again, is in the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital, another highly experienced center. Cryoballoon had slightly more reconnections than RF, but that's not the key finding. The key finding is similar to the burn study. OMG, we don't really understand AF or AF ablation. And this is why I am not super enthusiastic about the big pulse field ablation news. Yes, PFA might be some faster. It may not harm the esophagus, but it's three times the cost and all it does is destroy left atrium. PFA will be great for industry. They will sell more expensive stuff. It will allow for faster ablation, perhaps by less skilled operators because it might be easier. The emphasis on might be easier. Doctors will benefit financially too, doing more AF ablation and faster AF ablation. But I don't see how a new way to isolate PVs or parts of the atria is a way to advance the field of AF. To me, big answers in AFib will likely come from basic labs and strong thinking, not from EP labs where we use uh, obliteration of electrograms from myocytes as a surrogate marker to make us happy. All right, next topic. Speaking of surrogate markers, JAMA has published a somewhat technical but important paper on surrogate markers in clinical trials. Now, surrogate markers are something that can be measured, say, an LDL or BNP, that associate with an important outcome. It's easier to measure these things than, say, total number of deaths or MIs or heart failure events. Surrogate markers should be plausibly on the causal path to the outcome of interest, but that is not enough. Observational studies have to associate it with the outcome, and, of course, trials should also confirm that if you improve a surrogate, you improve the outcome. Of course, the biggest fail ever of a surrogate marker were PVCs after MI. 
He has the story of caste again. Back in the 1980s, we knew PVCs after an MI, especially in patients with LV dysfunction, associated with a higher rate of death. And he had drugs that suppressed this surrogate marker, so-called antiarrhythmic drugs. But as you all know now, antiarrhythmic drugs did suppress the PVCs, but instead of reducing death, patients who took the antiarrhythmic drugs and enjoyed surrogate marker suppression died at a much higher rate. The authors of the most recent paper, first author Joshua Wallach, were interested in studying a table of 100 surrogate markers that the FDA had green-lighted for use as primary endpoints in their regulatory trials. Now, we know that our oncology friends have previously shown that a thing called progression-free survival, that is, the stability of a tumor on a scan, does not correlate well with overall survival. It's less well known how these other surrogate markers perform as reliable indicators of clinical outcomes. So, in a massive undertaking, their supplement is hundreds of pages, these authors reviewed meta-analyses of clinical trials of 37 surrogate markers of non-cancer diseases. They excluded pediatric diseases and a slew of genetic vaccine and, uh, and other cancer diseases. Their primary sample was 37 surrogate markers for 32 unique chronic diseases, chronic diseases that we see every day. Their main outcome measure was a correlation between the surrogate and clinical outcomes in the meta-analysis of trials. And the meta-analysis were only trials, no observational studies. Finding number one, for the majority of surrogate markers approved by the FDA that could be used as a primary endpoint in a regulatory trial, 59% of them for 21 chronic diseases, there were zero, zero eligible meta-analysis, translation, no data. Finding number two, for 15 surrogates or 41% of 14 diseases, at least one meta-analysis was filed, and this included 54 meta-analyses in total. These 54 studies reported on 109 unique surrogate marker clinical outcome pairs. And cardiac adjacent surrogate outcome pairs included things like hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and hypertroglyceridemia. Now, some brief notes on these 54 meta-analyses. First, about 26% were industry-funded and only 17% reported a high-strength correlation. The remaining 50 pairs reported only slopes and effect estimates and results from meta-regression analysis or some other measure of association or prediction, 52% of which reported at least one statistically significant result. 48% did not. They have a figure, figure three, which sums it up. Most often, there is no evidence for correlation between surrogate markers and outcomes. Weak and limited evidence occurred in more than half the surrogate outcome pairs, and strong evidence was present in less than 5% of these surrogate markers. Some specific cardiac surrogates, high cholesterol. Oh, the authors found 11 meta-analyses, but it reported inconsistent evidence on the strength of association between the reduction in LDL and various clinical outcomes. Although all the meta-analysis claimed that reductions in LDL were associated with significant improvements in at least one clinical outcome, only one meta-analysis reported high strength coefficients of determination between low LDL and major vascular events. Now, the, the above is really important as FDA approves and we accept new drugs based solely on the reduction of LDL. Recall, my friends, that statins are the most studied drugs of all time, and we know as near as scientific fact gets that these drugs reduce LDL cholesterol and reduce CV outcomes. But this correlation is not as well known for other non-statin drugs. I mean, you can think, for instance, of CTEP inhibitors. Hypertension. Ten meta-analyses offered inconsistent evidence on the strength of association between reductions in blood pressure and improvements in cardiovascular outcomes and all-cause mortality. But here, at least the most recent meta-analysis reported that reductions of 5 millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure were associated with a decreased incidence of major adverse cardiac events. And I will link to that massive uh, meta-analysis as published in Lancet. And interestingly, there were other dubious markers as well that the authors noted hemoglobin A1c, bone mineral density, and even FEV1 for COPD, 
these had poor correlations with clinical outcomes. So my comments. The authors point out that there is no consensus on the minimal strength of association between the treatment effects measured by the surrogate versus that of clinical outcomes. They measured correlation coefficients, but even these are limited by being purely statistical measures, and of course, correlations rely on arbitrary cutoffs. I want here to remind everyone that even seemingly strong surrogates, say non-fatal MI, can be somewhat doubtful. Recall the David Brown paper in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2009, which I will link to. His team studied how well non-fatal MI acts as an outcome measure for all-cause or CV death in coronary disease trials. They did a similar type study looking at trial-level correlation between MI and all-cause and CV death. They set out that a correlation greater than 0.8 would be ideal if MI would be a good predictor of death. And they looked at 144 trials, including more than a million patients, and boom, they found that non-fatal MI did not meet the threshold for surrogacy for either all-cause or CV death. Correlation coefficients were extremely low. And when they separated old versus new coronary disease trials, the correlation worsened, which makes sense, right? Because... We now have increasingly sensitive troponin assays that make MI an easier diagnosis to make, which probably makes it a poorer outcome measure. Here's the summary point for all of us users of evidence. We should always be mindful of the primary endpoint. In days of old, guideline-directed medical therapy of heart failure, for instance, was established by measuring death, alive or dead, no bias, no need for correlation. Now we're measuring things like BNP or heart failure hospitalizations. That's a lot different. Even blood pressure, a relatively important surrogate. Well, we have now renal denervation is approved. It's set to become very popular. But it only reduces a surrogate measure of blood pressure by a minimal amount over six months. This is miles and miles and miles away from improving outcomes like death or stroke. Now, there can be argument about regulatory thresholds, but we can all agree that this most recent paper surely shows a lack of strong evidence between what FDA allows on the market and confidence that a treatment really works to improve important clinical outcomes. Take a look at this JAMA paper by Wallach et al. It's quite sobering. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I am grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating on whatever podcast app you use. These things help uh, other people find us. If you have a disagreement, uh, go on the heart.org website, write it. I love seeing these comments and I learn from them. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.